Hi everyone, I'm going to go through building a roller coaster by joining two different functions, which is what we did in class already. So I'm just going to go over that same material. Two functions we're going to try to join are f1, which we will make be a parabola, and f2. You can get um, the subscript of the one and two like that, and then you shine it just by typing the number right after you type the letter. There they are. And now we're going to put some transformations on them. So let's put some parentheses around the X and inside there we'll put our horizontal translation H1. And outside of parentheses, we'll put our vertical translation K1. Notice I'm subtracting H and adding K. That's so that the slider moves in the same direction as the object for H. And so that a larger number on K is intuitively sliding it up the screen towards larger values of Y. I'm also going to put a dilation coefficient out here, something that stretches and compresses it, A1, the VR, um, one for that. Now, a uh, horizontal and a vertical stretch and compression on a parabola look the same. So the one that's outside here would go through different values than one that's inside here, so I, but I only need one of them. They accomplish the same result. When we do transformations on sign, we're going to need both. Let's start with the translations. So I will have x minus H2. And I'm going to do plus k2. So subscripts become really handy when you have a lot of different functions. a2 is out there. And then in here, instead of putting b2 multiplying x, I'm going to have it be dividing. Because I want to have that counterintuitive nature be intuitive when I move the slider. So by dividing instead of multiplying, when I move the slider to larger numbers, it stretches it out, which is, to me, intuitive. And then a stretches it vertically. It also feels intuitive. H moves it the same direction as the slider. And K moves it up and down with larger and smaller numbers. So all of that seems to be working appropriately. Um, I wanted to put these in folders. So what I can do for that is take the word folder and name it F1. And then I can drag F1 into this and the other ones. Oh, that was a mistake. And then you also can come up here and say insert a folder with the plus button F2. Drag those into folders. Now we're going to be connecting these two at an arbitrary value. Um, we could make that arbitrary value be right around three for our purposes. And um, let's get this parabola to look pretty good. It's a bit, yeah, let's have it come down into the left a little bit so that you're swooping through the parabola and on your way up you switch over to a sine function. Um, maybe we'll open it up just a little bit more. That's hard to use. So let's change the range on this one so that's easier to use. So instead of going from negative 10 to 10, I'm going to go from 0 to 3. And somewhere else. And then when I drag it, I have a little more control. We're going to aim for switching at three. That'll be fine. We're going to come out of that parabola and into a sine curve. Um, the sine curve, we're going to need to let's get this back close to zero. Um, let's, let's open this up also. So right now, it's a pretty dangerous curve. Pretty dangerous curve down here in the valleys. Um, and at three, so I want to slide this over. Maybe open it up a little bit. That's visually pretty close. What I want is the same slope right here. So the slope of the tangent line at 3, the parabola, will have the same slope. The tangent line will have the same slope um, as a tangent line does on the sine curve at 3. Uh, I can only do that visually by looking. It looks like it's about the same slope for those two. But let's actually get those slopes plotted by letting Desmos do the work for us. So f1 prime of x is there. And that's handy that it's also red. So we're going to change it to dashed to represent the derivative. So you don't get confused between the two red curves. And f2 prime of x is blue. Looks like just another sine curve. Surprise, it is another sinusoidal curve. The derivative of sine is cosine. 
I'll make that one dash to two. There we go. Now we can tell the difference between the sine curve, the original function that we're using for F2, and the derivative of it, F2 prime. Um, and then we also can tell when these two are meeting is when we're looking at the red and the blue ones. We know which ones we're associated with and what their derivatives. And we're looking at the value of three, and we were pretty close. When they are equal, they intersect. We're not looking for them to be tangent. We're just looking for these two to cross. And it's really close. So we could just slide the sine curve a little bit to the left or right. Again, our slider is too coarse. Um, if it was way off, the things that we could do is we could, of course, open and close it. And then I can just do Control Z to get back to where I was. And do, um, we could compress and stretch it. Uh, we can move it left and right. But moving up and down makes no difference. That is not going to change the slope at x equals 3. It's just going to change where that point is plotted above or below, but not how slanty it is. Slanty is a bit covered. So then zooming back in over here. Um, I want a little more defined control as I move each. I'm moving it between 1.3 and 1.5. So I'm going to click on this value down here and change it to 1.3. So that was one and I what I needed and 1.5. And that's going to give me a lot more values that I can slide through with my slider. The comma. There we go. See how much more fine control we can get. I want them to meet right at three. So some zooming and things like that can work, but I don't really get down to it. I'm going to want to um, know the numerical values. And I could define my slider once more. I'm not going to do it more than this once more. Between 1.458 and 1.6. And when we're done with this, it's still going to look not quite smooth. You'll be able to see the transition, but it's going to be good enough to hand off to an engineer and have them go and build it. Because the difference will be in the tenth digit. If we're talking meters here, that would be a tenth of a millimeter which um, is not going to be that dangerous for us. All right, I don't think I can do better than that. Let's see where that actual point is. Instead of being at three, it was at, well, that's confusing. Um, so it's rounding to three there instead of being exactly three. So let's go ahead and put in a table that has these values. Uh, but we're starting at three, starting at one. I'm going to look at, F1 prime of x and just a tab to move over, not actually, of x1, because that's what our input value is on this table. And F2 prime of x1. There we go. Um, again. If I click and hold, that's how you change the colors. And it's click and hold, and up comes this dialog box. So we're going to go to three and see how that does. Oh, that's really nice. All right, so I managed to get them at three. Let's say I missed, and it was actually 3.0001. Then let's just change the point where they meet 3.001, because we do have that kind of control over what's necessary and what's arbitrary in our design work. Then we want to work on a similar table. Maybe I can just copy this table. No, it doesn't want you to drag. Um, so I'm going to get this table instead of by typing the table. I'll go up to the plus and click on the table. And uh, I still like to use x1. And we're going to, instead of the derivatives, we're going to start with f1. On x1. And we're going to do f2. And x1. And just make the colors match again. So I'm going to still. And then it's still blue. 
It doesn't really help to have them on anyway. Um, oops, no. All right, let's just go home. There we go. You see that while their derivatives match up because they intersect there, the curves themselves are way off. But that's okay because we know that on F2, the B1, the vertical translation, shifting it up and down, does not change the slope at that point. So if I move it down, notice that the derivatives don't change at all. As if I move it left and right, all right, it's, it's much too fine. I'll just go right now and control Z because that would have just undone all the work that I worked on. If I change something else, everything else is messed up. Undo. Um, you can also get undo right here. So we want to look at our input value three. I'm going to grab K, drag the blue one down. That's really much. That's really close. It looks like I need to bring it down another to subtract these two. It looks like it's going down just a little bit more. So going back up, 0, 0.5, 1, plus 0, 0.05, 1. What am I doing now? Looks like I was up. 0, 7, 1. And then the third digit, add two more. And that is the first, second, third, fourth, first, second, third, fourth digit. So let's make this a little less, 2, 8. Or two nine. Oh no, that's pretty close already because the slim rounds easily to the value that we want with the four five nine there, and this goes four six. Um, so that was really easy to see how these were different, and because k is a direct translation, it's added on after the rest of the function happens. It was really easy to see the difference in the table between their y values, where they're plotted vertically, and just change it by that much. Then I can just grab this value and copy it paste it in place of that addition. That's the value level. So now I've got a pretty simple A value and a pretty simple B value for the dilation, the stretching and compression. I've got a little bit more complicated H and K for the shifting to make it be in exactly the right place to switch. Um, let's turn off the derivatives. They are no longer needing to be displayed, but I do want to keep them there in case I want to see them again. And then I'm going to come up here and add the domain because I want this one to stop at three and the blue one to start at three. So let's go ahead and do open curly brackets and um, have x be less than or equal to. So I type the less than key, which is above the comma, and then the equals key that shares a key with the plus, and then three. And it comes down and stops and then close my curly brackets. I wanted to start over here at say negative six, then I could on the other side of the X in one statement have oh, missed it. Negative six and then again less than and equal to X. There we go. Starting here and sliding down to this point, switching over to the sine curve. Which makes the sine curve, we can collapse all this now. So we've got the folder, the F2, the blue one, and we're going to start. This one so at three. Let's so we first have x, and it's going to be greater than or equal to an x. And then x is going to be less than or equal to, I don't know how far should we go. Let's just go up to 10. Just for the heck of it. And that looks pretty nice. Nice first curve coming in parabolically, and then switching over to a sine curve to come down to the rest of the roller coaster. Um, and if we switch that first one over to blue, just for looking at it for the sake of how the transition looks, you can see right here, there is a little bit of a nuance of a shift. Um, so we could do a better job of switching from one to the other than the fourth decimal place, but it's already pretty ridiculous level of precision for what we have. Just switch that back to red and then um, close, close, and I'll eventually put these into a folder, but I'll do that off camera. And zooming in at this point, you can see that we have a nice smooth transition. All right. 
Um, I'm into the fourth digit of a Zoom, and I've got at that point um, a slight change, and I do still have what looks like the same slope right there. So you can barely even notice that among all the rattle on your roller coaster ride. Thank you very much. I hope this helped. Bye.